Hello and thank you for joining me once again for the latest installment of The Vault. My name is Julie Fry and I'm the curator at Stan Hewitt Hall and Gardens. This week we're going to conclude our series talking about F.A. Cyberling and his business history. So for this final installment, and it's by no means the end of the Cyberling Rubber Company story, we will find some time in the future to circle back, but we're going to focus on Cyberling Rubber Company during the Great Depression. So in the 1930s, of course, like every other business in America, the Cyberlings experienced some financial hardship and their business went through some financial hardships related to the Great Depression. But that didn't mean that F.A. necessarily got any less busy or was any less active in the company. And there were several really interesting projects that he was involved with at the same time. One of being at Washington, D.C., the presidential level, they formed something called the National Recovery Administration, which was the NRA back in the 1930s. For many of us, that means something different, but in 1930s, the NRA was responsible for kind of trying to normalize the economy, to create an even playing field between larger corporations and smaller business so that everyone could try to recover at the same time. So FA participated in 1933 in creating a rubber code, which is a way to try to stabilize rubber businesses and also make sure that those smaller manufacturers were getting a piece of the pie and the larger corporations weren't pushing those small businesses out. So this is a quote from the Akron Beacon Journal. December 20th, 1933, quoting F.A., I called a meeting of 24 smaller manufacturers, eliminating the leaders who were in hopeless opposition, and out of that meeting came a code signed by 21 members, 70% of the industry and one half of the volume. Thereupon, the government called a meeting of the entire industry in Washington yesterday, and when their program was adopted, and we now have a code. It, of course, satisfies no member of the industry in its entirety, but nevertheless is the best that could be produced out of the conflict of opinion and interest that has prevailed. So this was very important because Cyberling Rubber being a smaller business during the Great Depression, they struggled with um, getting enough product sold and getting pushed out by those larger corporations. The other thing that happened almost at the same time was that um, the mail order catalog business really grew during the Great Depression. So you think, uh, and the big one back then was Sears and Robux. So they were the Amazon of their day, if you want to make a comparison. And what happened with Sears and Robux was they had presence already. They were a huge company and they could deliver goods very easily and they were able to deliver a wide variety of goods. So they started to offer tires, but they could price cut a lot of those smaller rubber companies, including Cyberling Rubber Company. So it created a price war right within the tire industry just after that rubber code had been established. And F.A. was going to Washington, D.C. pretty regularly, trying to get a handle on those mail order businesses, trying to get some kind of oversight to make sure that they weren't putting rubber companies out of business and was ultimately successful in trying to kind of create a little bit of control and a little bit of oversight so that didn't happen at the time. So another big challenge, of course, during the Great Depression was lack of income coming into the business. And so at one point, around 1930, actually, F.A. had to borrow about $4 million to infuse the Cyberling Rubber with cash. This allowed him to meet payroll, allowed the company to buy those raw materials that they needed in order to be able to produce tires. Um, and of course, though, the business never really picked up like he hoped every year. There was a conversation of maybe this year we'll finally make a profit. Maybe this year the economy will turn around. And as we know, the Great Depression just went on and on and on. And so it got to a point where by 1937, he still owed about 2.3 million of that $4 million. So they were in a need to kind of restructure that debt or infuse some new cash in. And F.A. had a very good friend at that time, a man named Edgar Davis, who was an oil tycoon, who F.A. had loaned money to in the 20s when he was experiencing a financial hardship. And Edgar remembered that very fondly. So at this point, he stepped forward and offered to help F.A by helping him with this debt. So he put up some shares of US rubber stock, which is a company that he had a controlling interest in, as well as $250,000 in cash. Um, unfortunately, once those debts were restructured and paid off, all that goodwill and friendship went by the by, and a power struggle ensued to get that collateral, where the Cyberling Rubber Company and thereby the Cyberling family felt that the collateral belonged to them, and Edgar Davis said, no, it was never my intention to turn that collateral over to you. That collateral belongs to me. And it really obviously ruined the friendship. It was extremely stressful on the family. You can think of all those other lawsuits and things that F.A. had already had to live through. And it, in many ways, it felt like he was kind of right back into the mix of all of that litigation. 
So it went to court and unfortunately the Cyberlings lost. So in 1940 the decision was made that that collateral did belong to Edgar Davis and unfortunately if the Cyberlings had won that I think it would have been a bit of a different situation for them moving into those last few decades of their time here at Stan Hewitt that would have given their bottom line a huge boost but it just wasn't meant to be. So we'll continue that Cyberling Rubber company story and at some point in the future touch on those last few decades of family ownership of the company and what happened after 1940. So stay tuned for that and other sessions of The Vault in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for joining me today.